parce que le mur de Wii, ça fait aussi peur que les grottes de Remouchant quand j'étais petite. Ah, le mur de Wii, c'est vraiment une, une course, une montée très difficile, très, euh, très intense aussi. Et euh, malgré que c'est court, euh, ça, ça fait très mal. Donc c'est vraiment une, une montée qui est spécifique aux purs grimpeurs. Et euh, moi, je suis un peu trop lourd pour, pour jouer avec. Mais euh, bon, si, si j'arrive à, à entamer le, le mur de Wii bien placé, on ne sait jamais. Ça me fait plaisir d'avoir mes supporters, en tout cas, qui sont présents. Et, euh, bon, ça, après, ça motive toujours. C'est vrai que c'est toujours plus amusant de, 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 de faire des courses euh, lorsqu'il y a du public au bord de la route que quand il euh, n'y a personne sur une, le Tour d'Espagne par exemple où des fois on fait 50 km sans avoir une seule personne c'est un peu différent donc euh, c'est vrai que ça motive
vamos a llevar un grupo de Van Tommen, een landgenoot van Hekke, een andere landgenoot. Patetsky, een Pol en Helminen, dat is een Fin, maar die komt uit voor uh, landbouwkrediet. Daar rijdt hij nu op kop in zijn groene shirt. En die mannen hebben een uh, voorsprong. God, een bak hoor, 13 minuten. 13 minuten, maar dat was 17 minuten. En je hebt het gemiddelde berekend, Karel. Ja, ik denk dat die mannen aan een gemiddeld van net geen 41 per uur zitten. En dat het peloton vandaag rondrijdt op dit moment dan toch met een gemiddelde van 38 km per uur. Dus... Uh... Ja, het is Een van de dingen is bij. Minder, want ze zitten nu op een kilometer of tien en er zijn ongeveer drie uur gekoerst. Dit zijn beelden van de doortocht van het peloton op de muur van Hoei hier. En we zagen toen een man van Rabobank helemaal vooraan en dat was Slachter. Slachter die het peloton een klein beetje aan het afslachten was, al is dat een relatieve beeldspraak. Want op dit moment deed het er nog niet zoveel toe. De grote favorieten die zaten diep verscholen in de buik van dat peloton bij die eerste passage op de muur van Hoei. Belangrijk om mee te geven, Van Hekken heeft hier wel de punten gepakt voor het bergklassement. Preben Van Hekken leek mij ook de beste op die klim bij de koplopers. Daar het kopje van Philippe Gilbert op 6, 7 na.
verwacht hij daarvan? Is ja. dat effectief zo of is dat een alibi zoeken voor mocht het mislukken? Zo kennen we hem niet, maar ik ben benieuwd. Er is die ene foto die verspreid is, een soort van alternatieve Zorro-foto. Met een uh, doek voor, voor de mond, een sjaaltje voor de mond. Alleen het masker ontbrak nog. <laughs> ik, heb, ik heb hier ook al een paar uh, Luxemburgse fermgezette vrouwen zien rondlopen met een geel t-shirt op. En daar stond op El Pistolero Killer. <laughs> ah. Fermgezette. Ja, dus waren supporters van Schleck die El Pistolero komen afmaken. In hoei. Hij past maar beter op, want... Maar wij zitten braaf. Hier, de, de, de televisie. Staat u recht aan de televisie staan? Ja, klopt. Klap maar, we gaan op televisie. Ze zijn op 500 meter van de finish, volgens ja, dat, de wedstrijdradio. Ja, dat duurt dan nog wel een paar minuten. Want je weet hoe dat gaat. Ik overdrijf natuurlijk een beetje. Maar uh, dat is daarna bijna stilstaan. Hè. Je weet, daar in die S-bochtjes, die uh, chicane, waar het buitenkant uh, een goede 18% uh, procent stijlte gaat is. Maar binnen gaat dat naar de 30%. Procent. Dus je moet daar een beetje uh, kunnen richten. De profs nog op 80 kilometer, voorsprong nu naar 10 en een half minuut. Ze hebben dus toch nog wel wat werk hoor. Temperaturen zijn fantastisch en er is heus niet zoveel wind. Ja. Die van Saxo nog altijd goed gegroepeerd in blok. Dat gaat zo als je beseft dat je iemand hebt die het kan afmaken. Ja, en die temperaturen en uh, de vakantie zorgen ervoor dat er een ongeziene massa staat op de muur van Hoei. Veel meer dan. Heel tot ons staan. Slecht daar. Rodriguez. Kirsten. En het vertrek, die van de moeder is het eerste dan. Mies van de Broek. Van de Ja, en begint dat weer. En dan hebben we daar Marianneke Vos. Ah ja. Voilà. Het kruisboogje opgespannen en Vos wint voor de vierde keer de Waalse pijl. En wie is dan tweede? Wie anders dan? Het is een stuk, jongens. Dat is toch vol hè? Ja. Het is wel heel duur. You could get yourself dropped off the back and have to use an awful lot of pressure to get yourself back into this race. Look at the magnificent backdrop there of the Meuse, and that is the Pont Père Pier. Pont Père Pier, across the Meuse River there, one side of uh, Belgium to the next. This river, uh, part of Liège, Baston Liège, in the backdrop, as well as Flesch alone. And the hilly part, the Ardennes of Belgium, is always a surprise to me. You come from the flatlands of the cobble classic Paris Roubaix and Tour of Flanders and go to the hills. The hills of the Ardennes look like gigantic mountains because the, dif the difference is so drastic from the flat roads to the hillier terrain of the Ardennes uh, countryside. Also, a lot more painful in the legs if you're not a good climber. Well, Saxo Bank's still doing a phenomenal job of uh, doing the pacemaking, but look at those riders in the orange jerseys there. That's uh, Uscatel, Uscari. They're obviously looking after their man, Sammy Sanchez, who, I have to say, looked very relaxed at the start of the day. He's a great bike rider. HTC High Road also moving up to the front, but right in the middle there, wearing number 21, Alberto Contador. Very easy to pick him out, isn't it, Bob, with those yellow sunglasses of his? It is indeed, and his very smooth pedaling style, and the fact that he stays near the front of nearly every bike race he enters throughout the year. Saxobank having a great spring campaign so far this year. 
Ronde van Vlaanderen, the Tour of Flanders, one of the biggest one-day races in the world, taken out by Nick Noyens, a Sa Saxo Bank rider. So Saxo Bank, a lot of good morale. They've already won a big classic, and Alberto Contador would like to add Flesh Alone to their list of wins so far this year. But that was rather surprising, almost a shock, as it were. Nick Noyens, one of the not one of the pre-race favorites, was able to beat men of the stature of Philippe Gilbert, Fabian Cancellar, and other previous winners. Alessandro Balan, Nick Noyens, a great ride for the Saxo Bank squad in the Tour of Flanders. Yes, but I think today Nick Noyan's uh, job as we look here at the Chateau of Ain. Uh, this climb is known as the, the Côte de Ben Ain, and it's not too far away from the Chateau there with a magnificent moat around it. We were talking just a few moments ago about Alberto Contador. Bob, he's had a fantastic season so far when you think he was fourth overall in the Tour of the Argarve, and then he came up and won two very important races, the Tour of Mercia in March, and of course he followed that up with the Tour of Catalonia. Today, I think he'd like to try and get himself a victory if he could here in the flesh well on. Good to see the BMC riders rotating to the front. They have a solid squad, a fairly new team in professional cycling. Cadell Evans, the big star of that, but also George Hincapi, the veteran American campaigner. If he does do the Tour de France later in the summer, I believe it'll be his 16th participation, which will tie the all-time record set by Joop Zodemuk many years ago. That's phenomenal. You can see the damage now, Bob. We talked about this war of attrition. It's happening at the back end of the peloton. One by one, these riders are starting to crack on these repetitive little climbs here in the Ardennes. This is the Côte de Benain. The gap is now down to four minutes with 41 kilometers to go. That's just 25 miles of racing. We should know the outcome of this race within the last hour, within the next hour. 41 clicks, just about 25 miles to the finish. The average speed really kicking up now. It always, always amazes me at how fast these classics are in the last hour of racing. Riders absolutely flying, and it's uh, great to see. Here's the, the uh, Lamprey squad. It must be that Damiano Cunigo had a little bit of a problem. Unlike Jurgen Vandenbroek, his whole team has come back to try to pace him back into the lead. Il Piccolo Principe, he's a rider tacked onto the back of his teammates. Fourth wheel, he'll try to get back into the peloton and have a chance to win. He's a great classic specialist. He's won Tour of Lombardia, a similar race, a little bit longer, longer hills, but also one of the hilly classics to finish off the racing season. Well, I have to tell you there, I think, of the uh, Lamprey, all of the riders uh, left in this group went back there to look after their man, Damiano Cunigo, and that's an indication that he has got fine form here this afternoon and of course let's not forget it's an ideal type of finish for him because he's a guy who can sprint but also climbs exceptionally well and this finish at Mudukui I would think is tailor-made for a man like him. Very punchy accelerations from Damiano Cunigo, fast sprint, powerful rider, good climber, his Achilles heel has always been time trialing, that's uh, prevented him from winning more stage races but that does make him a formidable comp competitor in all of the big classics. Second position there, that's Maxime Montfort. So obviously the race is not for him this afternoon. He's doing the pacemaking at the front for Team Leopard Trek. I think the ticket is going to go out today for Frank Schleck. And of course, Andy would like to have a little go as well. But Andy thinking a little bit further down the road, he's obviously got his mind set on a little bicycle race in the month of July. A little race called the Tour de France. Astana moving to the front. That's the team of Alexander Vinokurov, winner of Liège, best on Liège, I think on two occasions in his career and looking to do something special in the finale of the Flush Alone. Flush Alone, it's about resistance, power, endurance, but mostly patience. We'll see who can make the final acceleration to the line, assuming they catch the breakaway, but look at that gap. Just in the last three or four kilometers, they've lost another 30 seconds of their advantage. Well, it's on these climbs, isn't it, Bob? These very nasty climbs. They might only be one, 1.5 kilometers long, but it gives the, the main field a chance. Oh, now this is a little move from AG to our Le Mondial. They really are now starting to get into the grippy part of this race as we start to see these accelerations coming forward. This looks like uh, Bill Kadri of AG2R. He's an exceptional climber, this young man, and he's uh, trying to get himself an advantage over the front end of the main field. He will hope, I don't think he'd want to ride away on his own in a situation like this, but he'd like to try and force a group of maybe five or six riders together to ride across this three and a quarter minute gap. Well, Bill Kadri, sensing a good moment to put in an attack, see if some riders can join him. Generally, when the peloton is under the escort of a couple of very strong teams like Leopard Trek and Saxo Bank, it's not the ideal moment to attack. But when you feel it, you have good legs, you got to put in your move. Bill Kadri will most certainly not win in a sprint, so he would prefer a little bit of a smaller group. And a breakaway is the ideal situation for Kadri, and he's gone off the front.
Well, that was a very good move, and now it looks like somebody from Astana has seen this as a possibility. But look, there's the still organization at the front end of that pack, and it's uh, consistently Astana in the second, third position. They're obviously thinking a bit later on in the race for Alexander Vinokurov, who is showing some pretty good form in this season, which a lot of people are saying may well be his last season as a professional cyclist. He will probably retire at the end of this year. Of course, he'll be looking to participate in the Tour de France. That's the top of the Côte de Benin for the main field. But, Bob, look at that gap now inside of three minutes bear in mind in the early part of this race we were looking at a 17 minute gap it really is now starting to tumble well in that climb alone just in the last few hundred meters another 30 seconds came off the advantage here's the second man from the peloton chasing across trying to catch Biel Kadri another Astana rider trying to get across to the second man on the road four men still in the front that's Andre Grievko from Astana that new McLaren designed specialized machine trying to close the gap now to be El Kadri and let's see if they can work together and make some progress against the, the break weight but the gap oh my gosh it's already under three minutes just like that just at the snap of a finger and the gap coming down it is plummeting the gap now down to the four leaders let's uh, not forget that there are four leaders in this bike race we haven't seen an awful lot of them because this is where the action is in the main field of those four leaders uh, Matty Hellman from Landbau Credit uh, Maxime uh, Van Tommer from Katusha Perken Van Haker from Top Sport Vlaanderen and Masej Paterski of Team Liquid Gas Cannondale. They're still putting their backs into it, but Bob, they must know the writing is pretty much on the wall here because the main field now have got the hammer down. We're looking at average speeds here of about 45, 46 kilometers an hour in the peloton as Andre Grivko is back in the main field and a lot of work being done by BMC Racing. I wonder if they believe their man uh, Greg Van Avermaet has got a chance here or even Matthias Frank, the Swiss rider on that squad things getting dodgy at the back of the peloton gaps being open a lot smaller group now the peloton being willed away by all of these accelerations from little attacks like BL Cadres and of course the pacemaking being put in by three teams now Saxo Bank's been on the front quite a bit as well as the Leopard Trek team and even Astana now coming to the front there's BL Cadre resisting the accelerations of the peloton just dangling off the front a very tall order this is a, a bit of a long shot for BL Cadre to stay away to the finish line. Uh, you can tell me really what you think about a move like that. It's not really very <laughs> sensible, is it, when you've got the whole of the, the big teams in, in this race, the flesh will on, riding on the front end, doing the pace, making just a quick glimpse there. I just noticed uh, Damiano Cunigo back in contention, but he'll be gasping for breath. That was Cunigo, the pink and blue rider from Lamprey, just tacking onto the back. So we see Astana rider. Looks like Griefko perhaps going again. I thought I saw Jens Voigt coming across the gap there from this rider to the field that's chasing iron. There's the field altogether. HTC High Road now back at the front. A little bit of a separation there from about four or five riders off the front of the field. Well, that could very well be for a move down towards the end by Tony Martin. We've gone over now the top of the Côte de Benin. Uh, we're on the, the plateau up at the top above the River Meuse. They will drop down to the River Meuse again, Bob, and in about uh, seven kilometres time, they'll head up to the Meur de Huy for the penultimate time, and that's where I think we'll see some fireworks. Yes, absolutely. You want to be in good position, maybe not make your move on the second climb of the Meur de Huy, but you definitely need to be positioned well so that you don't have to accelerate across the gaps that will inevitably be opened up o over the next uh, ascension of the Meur de Huy. Well, the attack's now starting to come thick and fast, and look what it's doing to the uh, time gap there. Two and a half minutes now as everybody scrambles to stay in contention. The gaps are now starting to appear. Impressive. Kadri, Kadri here, Bob, he's only got himself about a 15-second advantage, and very shortly, this is a pretty tricky descent off the top of the Côte de Bernay. Unfortunately, today it's dry. Very dry, perfect conditions for a bike race, cool, and uh, sun shining on the peloton. They'll be happy to see that. I've done the flush alone a number of times when it was pouring rain the whole day <laughs> makes a, a hard race even that much more difficult it is very strange to see this uh, springtime in the Ardennes because very often we've seen snow and rain be very predominant in this week in Belgium in, uh, in the month of April where in the past we have seen some nasty conditions I remember when Bernay Eno won Liege Baston Liege Bob a few years ago it started snowing right at the very start and only 13 riders actually finished that classic and Hino he won it by a mere 10 minutes <laughs> Rui Pevenage the second place man on the day but 10 minutes behind the Badger what a stroke of genius that was in Liege Baston Liege but the conditions made that gap much larger than it would normally be now it's much bigger groups that can test the finish line, so we'll see what happens today. But uh, Bernardino, one of the greatest cyclists of all time, of course, five-time winner of the Tour de France, and a winner of nearly all the classics that the, the sport has to offer. 
in a dominant, absolute annihilation of the peloton at Liege Bastogne, and maybe the worst conditions that that race had ever seen. Well, uh, this is uh, Kadri looking over his shoulder. Look at the way the main field now is starting to snake down this la large road. We're uh, looking for the descent, the real descent in earnest to bring us back down to the River Meuse. And then, of course, five kilometers to go, we're going to start to uh, to taste that climb of the Mur de Huy one more time. And you can be certain there'll be a big battle, Bob, to be in the first uh, 15 to 20 places. Because the problem with the Mur de Huy, it's such a steep climb that riders uh, have uh, have mechanical incidents. They drop the chain and uh, you know they're, they're looking to to get themselves into the right gear and that nearly always somebody slipped back to the uh, rear end of the peloton and that is what guys like Alberto Contador like uh, Joachim Rodriguez like Van Avermaet, Tony Martin they don't want to get involved in any of those incidents at the back end of the pack and that's where the teammates come in they take their riders near the front of the peloton so their team captain doesn't have to do any work to get himself in position then he defends his position of the second to last climb of the year to we but without your teammates you'd have to do all of that work all of those accelerations to stay near the front by yourself you'd be too exhausted to win the race and that's why cycling is such an important team sport and this is one of the races that graphically illustrates how important it is to have a, a strong team in order to win the big races well i think i just saw tj van garderen getting himself into that move for team htc but look at that nobody's getting off the front now bob as we start to line ourselves up for this final ascent penultimate ascent i should say of the mur de Huy. there's a three-man group going off the front but it's astana in control of the main field stretched out into a very long line and look at that gap two and a half minutes but i have to say those four men at the front of this bike race bob i think they're starting to weaken quite dramatically tj van garner and the young american on htc high road they had great success earlier in the year christian Kinis man on the front of the peloton I believe he races for the sky team christian Kinis, the german champion on the british sky team another big big money team in professional cycling tj van garden will want to try to help his team captain tony martin who won perry nice just a few weeks ago is on good form has a good chance to do something big in the flesh alone in today's race but it's all about biding your time and letting your teammates do the pace making at a, at a moment like this, making sure that your teammates get you to an ideal position. We're not too far away. I think uh, for that leading group of four, Bob, I would say we're looking at about uh, two and a half kilometers before we actually get into the town of Hui. Well, Van Garden has been brought back into the fold. And again, one after the other, these riders are trying to make those little moves. That's Philippe Gilbert, I think, moving up into second position, the rider from Omega Pharma Lotto. Philippe Gilbert, one of the hot pre-race favorites. Jürgen Vandenbroek, his teammate, will be doing a lot of work before the finale. Vandenbroek having a mechanical issue, had to fight his way back into the front of the field, but you can see that he's made it back there and perhaps has gotten enough time to catch his breath and start doing some of the work that Philippe Gilbert will depend on if he wants to win the Flesh Alone this year. Well, that sign there indicating five kilometers. That's not five kilometers to go to the finish. This is exactly the same road that the riders will come on once they go around this final little 30-kilometer loop. And that will indicate five kilometers to the top of the climb. Biel Kadri back in the main field. And now you can see the organization Omega Pharma Lotto at the front. They're obviously trying to set their man up, uh, Philippe Gilbert. It's going to be a little bit like a, a dash for the finish line, isn't it? Because everybody wants to get around that corner, the right-hand sweeping bend at the start of the Mur de Huy. You're absolutely right. It's almost almost like a field sprint just to get your rider in position so he doesn't lose time and you spend a lot of your teammates energy trying to keep your team captain out of danger the best squads do that week in and week out and they win the big races we'll see who was leading out whom coming into the second to the last climb of the mirror and of course the last time around it's absolutely critical for your teammates to get you in the right position so you have a chance to win the race a couple of riders up there for uh, uh, Uscatel Uscari, and obviously I think that today is going to be for Sammy Sanchez, or why not uh, Igor Anton, who is himself a very good climber when it comes to the, the finish of races like this. So we're looking at the Arrière du Peloton, the back end of the bike race, and that is uh, Sander Amber off the front there of, of uh, Belgium and of Top Sport Vlaanderen. A lot of work being done, Bob, by uh, Team Sky, professional cycling team from the United Kingdom, and I have to feel that that's for Simon Gerrans. Gerrans, the Australian, stage winner in the Tour de France, stage winner in the Tour of Spain. He's a very aggressive finisher, and especially on a course like this. Simon Gerrans, big star of the Sky team. Sky, a fairly recent addition to the professional peloton, and they've been able to hire...
Bradley Wiggins, perhaps an overall contender in the Tour de France this July. One of the best cyclists in the world, Bradley Wiggins. Comes from a track background, great time prowess, but he's also added solid climbing to his abilities and was he finished fourth in the Tour de France a couple of years ago. And Team Sky is sort of built around Bradley Wiggins, but they do definitely have some chances in the classics as well. Well, there you can see Gilbert. He's got all of his teammates, Bob. This is a little bit important, I think, now, because they obviously are looking to see whether they can put their man, Philippe Gilbert, into an ideal position at the start of the Mur de Huy. We're now in the outskirts of the town of Huy, which is nestled right up against the, the river Meuse, or Maas, as it's called, once you cross the border, and that's where Maastricht gets its name from. But you can see Omega Farmalotta. They are very keen now to do all of this pacemaking for Philippe Gilbert. The sp yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in 18 seconds that's a one kilometer to go to the summit of the climb and when they see that next lap it'll be one kilometer to go to the finish this is where everybody is concerned the Mur de Huy 1.3 kilometers long it goes up 121 meters but the gradient bob an average of nine percent but if we get to the top it's a lot worse than that in the corners it was almost a vertical wall when you come around the last couple of switchbacks before the finish line and uh, it's a, a very daunting climb especially when you've seen it twice already in the bike race and you know no matter how tired you are you have to do it another time also for the finish of the bike race interesting to see Gilbert so close to the front of the peloton third wheel coming through the village of Wee before the final climb so Philippe Gilbert very heads up very attentive at the front of the peloton leaving nothing to chance doesn't want to get caught behind a crash or some sort of problem from the other rider so he's staying right at the front of the peloton it's not easy to do physically but it does increase your luck throughout the day's proceedings one thing i hated about this climb bob was it starts off steep and it gets steeper as you get up towards the finishing line well it looks as if it's a little bit of a hard time here for matty hellman and the rider from landbau credit the man doing the pacemaking right on the front there is the liquid gas cannondale rider Matic paterski He's uh, doing a fine job of pacemaking, but it's once we, we're getting now to the tough part of this climb, and it'll be interesting to see just how fast the main field goes up this climb. Second position there is uh, Pre. <laughs> and he's trying to build himself up and an unassailable lead in the King of the Mountains classic. What a crowd. I don't think I've seen a crowd like this at Huy before. Massive crowds, 10, 15 people deep, hanging off all the balconies of all the homes leading up to the top of the climb. It's great to see the people come out. Of course, they're enjoying the beautiful weather, beautiful day here on the roads of the Flesh Alone. Huge crowd greeting the riders, not just the last lap, which will come in a few kilometers, but the second to last lap as well. Everybody in Belgium knows about this bike race, and it seems as if most of the countries come out to watch they love their bike racing, uh, certainly they've had a great festival uh, throughout the month of April because when you look at races like the Tour of Flanders, Bob, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, those races, uh, they get almost a million spectators on the side of the road. And I think uh, today they really are enjoying an incredible spring day here in the Ardennes. Mate. <laughs>
that man right in the middle of your screen, Philippe Gilbert, comes up with the win in the flesh below. Watch out for the big names, though, because just behind him, uh, you might just have spotted there. That, in fact, is uh, Joaquin Rodriguez, the other rider from Petit. Well, look at this, Bob. I'll have to take my hat off to this man because uh, Raven van Hacken, he looked as if he was in serious difficulty, but he's found something special to get himself a few more points, and I would think he's probably going to seal himself the victory in the King of the Mountains classification. <laughs> of 30 kilometers to go it's the one minute mark they lost a minute on the climb of the Murdukui that time under one kilometer to lose a whole minute it's pretty tough indeed that's when the legs are full of lactic acid and the energy has gone out of the break but only three men left also in the front well this is Enrico Gasparotto of Astana but look who's coming across your young man from the United States of America once again TJ Van Garderen this kid is going to be something special great riding by TJ Van Garderen in order to cover this attack you have to be fairly near the front and that's sometimes harder than the actual physical requirements of bike racing climbing well or time trying well or being a fast sprinter it's the battle for position and having the tenacity to continue <laughs> you 
could cover these breakaways from the back of the field, you have to be in the right position. Well, Van Garderen started the year off exceptionally well, Bobby. Finished to second overall in the tour of the Algarve. And uh, as you can see, looks like uh, that's Kolobnev coming across there as well, the uh, Russian national champion. On the Katusha squad at the bottom of that little breakaway with one of the Sky Riders, it looks like also. One minute and seven is the gap to the three men in the front now. TJ Van Garderen with Enrico Gasparotto. Kolobnev also in that breakaway. And here's one of the Yuskatel riders trying to get across also. Well, number 148, uh, that in fact is uh, Gorka Verdugo, a very aggressive bike rider from Muscatel Uscadi. This is a great team. It's been uh, a sponsor of Basque Cycling in uh, the northern part of Spain for an awful long time. And when we go down to the Tour de France, Bob, and uh, races in the Pyrenees, it's pretty much their playground, isn't it? Most certainly. They've had a lot of great results there over the years in the Pyrenees and the Alps. Noted as a climbing team, not a great uh, one-day classics team, generally speaking. But with Sammy Sanchez, the winner of the Olympic Games, you always have a chance to win these hilly classics. And so it's great to see Yuskatel, the Basque team of stage racers and climbers, doing well in the northern classics of Belgium. Well, we're down to three riders now. It looks as if uh, Matty Helmanen from uh, Team Landbau Credit uh, was uh, one climb too far for him, the Mur de Cui, this time. So we're now down to this three-man breakaway. That's a Pateski on the front uh, for Liquigas Cannondale. Preben van Hacke is the rider in the whiter jersey for Team uh, Top Sport van Vlaanderen. And, of course, Maxime van Tomp is in there for Katusha. But we now have a four-man group starting to chase across this gap. I have to say, TJ Van Garderen, as you said, Bob, he is only a kid. He's 23 years of age. And the amazing thing is he knows how to read these races. He's riding like a professional bike rider who's been in the game for 10 years. Very dangerous move coming off the front of the peloton. Omega seemed to have a lot of riders at the front going into the climb, but at the top of the climb, just a couple of men left with Philippe Gilbert, their team leader. So when you want to organize a chase of something like TJ Van Garderen going up the road with a very dangerous move, you need more riders. You need as many riders as you can have. And it, perhaps TJ understood the right moment to attack at the top of the Mur de Wee with one last ascension. They're coming across yeah. here to Matty Hellman and from the Vlanderen squad who was in the breakaway just a few moments ago. So great progress being made by the second group on the road led by TJ Van Garderen. Well, that big rider from uh, Team Sky Pro Cycling there in fact, it's Thomas Lovquist, the, the Swedish rider, silver medalist in the Olympic Games in the individual time trial, a big, strong bike rider. So this, Bob, this group of four riders coming across the gap is a very serious move. Spain on the counter-attack there as well because that's uh, Verdugo in second position and he's joined there by a rider from a uh, brand new squad uh, this year, uh, Movistar, it's a, a Pan Spanish cell phone company. But of course, it's the same squad that's been together for many, many years under a number of different names. Of course, started off years ago as the Reynolds squad of Pedro Delgado. And another a number of, uh, a name of a rider people might recognize, Miguel Indurain spent the entirety of his career in that program and of course won the Tour de France five times in a row. No, he certainly does. Now we've got uh, this group of five riders chasing the look now, Bob, inside of the one-minute mark. Kolobnev is the uh, Russian national champion. TJ Van Garden uh, in third, fourth position there from the United States. Thomas Lovquist, Enrico Gasparotto is in that turquoise jersey of Team Astana. I'm wondering what kind of an express train he's riding on here is the man who uh, previously was in the breakaway, the Finnish rider, Matti Helmanen of Team Landbau Credit. One minute or less, 54 seconds, the gap to that second little group, about a minute to the peloton. Peloton sensing the danger of this little move right here and uh, have put in a big acceleration. Looks as if the movie star man and Verdugo from Yuskatel are about to make contact as well. This is starting to be a pretty dangerous little breakaway. We're in the last 30 kilometers, the last 15 miles of the bike race, and so the momentum that the peloton is able to generate is continually reduced the closer we get to the finish line and these breakaways become more and more dangerous and when you have seven or eight highly motivated riders like we have in this little breakaway they have a good chance to succeed helmet in won't theoretically be asked to work. <laughs> He's been in the breakaway from the very opening kilometers of the bike race. Yeah, the Movistar riding again across there was uh, Vasily Kirienka, the Belarusian rider on Team Movistar, but there's still organization at the front end of this pack. Surprisingly enough, though, Bob, as you'd mentioned, Omega Farmer Lotto seem to have disappeared from the front end of the pack. They're probably playing a, a rather interesting little game here and waiting for the final part of this race because I wouldn't uh, put it past uh, Philippe Gilbert to try and get away before we get down to the run in uh, on the outskirts to and especially quite possibly on that final climb of the day before they come to the Murakui. 
Well, Philippe Gilbert is able to win in almost any situation out on the open road. He can win from breakaways. He can do solos. We saw him in Het Volk a couple of years ago do, I think, a 60-kilometer solo breakaway to win that big classic in Belgium to start the racing season off. Also from rather large groups, uphill, flat roads. Philippe Gilbert, one of the most complete all-rounders currently racing in bike and cycling today. Yeah, but Bo, I have to say, I think he changed an awful lot from when he was uh, the rider on Francais de Jure, and I think that's why he came back to Belgium, to learn the ropes of these one-day classics. He, he kind of swam around in the FDG for a, a long, long time and, and didn't progress, very much like Sylvain Chavanel decided he wanted to come across to a Belgian team, Team Quickstep, to learn the ropes of the game. Well, the, tactically, the Belgians are far superior to any country in the world. Johan Reniel from Belgium, tactically perhaps the best of all of the sports director. They always have a trick up their sleeves. They'll know exactly how to handle each tactical situation and uh, the nuance the way that the Belgian riders compete has always been fascinating to watch. They use impeccable tactics. They know the sport better than perhaps any other country. And Philippe Gilbert coming to Omega Pharma from a French program. He was on that team for a long time and now he's having great success on a Belgian team. Sometimes the pressure is too great and it's better perhaps for a young rider to start his career in a different country, especially if you're from Belgium because the pressure is incredible and sometimes they put too much pressure on the younger riders and they never reach their full maturation and, and their full success that they could have. Ouch! That's a little bit too much now for this man. He was in that breakaway early on, uh, Matty Helman, and he's going backwards. He'll very shortly be back in the main field. This counter move now, Bob, is looking for just 39 seconds. In fact, just around the corner there, I could see the cars behind the three-man leading breakaway. Kolobnev just sitting at the back there, the Russian national champion. He's a dangerous man to let go clear on the final few kilometers of a race like this because he's always ridden well in the Ardennes Classics. Oh, absolutely. Helman in going back to the field. Sip of water probably won't help him stay in the field before the finish, but that's a great ride by the Vlanderen man. And uh, he was in the breakaway throughout the day. Maximum publicity for his squad. No, certainly uh, talking about Alexander Kolobnev, he was fifth in the Amstel Gold Race uh, just three days ago, so he obviously is targeting the Ardennes Classics. And we can see now the big work being done here on the front by Team Garmin Cervelo. I uh, think they will be trying to set something up for one of their riders, uh, maybe Ryder Hegedal down towards the end, or quite possibly the Frenchman, Christophe Lemavel. Christophe Lemavel and Ryder Hegedal, the one-day hilly specialist for the Garmin squad, and Ryder Hegedal having a great Amstel gold race uh, just a few days ago. So on good form, Hegedal, after a uh, top-10 finish in last year's Tour de France. Now there you can see the counter move coming across the gap. Uh, they're halfway. Oh, look at that. It's 25 seconds to the counter move and another 25 seconds back to the peloton. Mikel Golas of Vacon Soleil, he's trying to ride across the gap here. You can just see that little counter move in front of him. He's uh, ridden across. In fact, Bob, it's almost over there because the main field have got these guys in the same straight. so far for the Movistar squad. Movistar, they were Case de Parnia the last few years. Great success from that team over the years. And now they have found a new sponsor, Movistar, and one of the best Spanish teams, along with Euskatel. The men always in the orange jersey and perhaps have the most passionate fans in all of cycling, the Basque people. Well, just look at those cars at the end of that long straightaway. That's 20 seconds separating this group from the leading group of riders. Kolobnev in this group, just making the junction there, Mikhail Golas, and if he looks over his shoulder, Bob, he's probably going to see the main field boring down upon them. Kolobnev, one of the best one-day specialists in cycling. Maxime Montfort, Leopard Trek on the front of the peloton, chasing down, along with the lotto riders from Omega Farm, and now they've come back to the front. This is the work that needs to be done before the last ascension of the Mur de Wii. They have a strong squad. It looks like four or five riders left in the front of the peloton. So great riding by Philippe Gilbert's teammates on the Omega Pharma squad. Yeah, but have you seen who's in the second row there? That is the team of Katusha. They're obviously thinking about their man, Joachim Rodriguez. He finished second in this bike race last year. And right now he's looking to see whether or not he can rival Philippe Gilbert on the run-up towards the finish. But a little bit of a problem in hand because there are two groups off the front end of this bike race. Uh, the three leaders 
so we're looking at Haya Bob uh, separated by just 12 seconds when you look at the way they're pedaling now the, the impetus has gone out of this breakaway the belief is no longer there and they're clicking off the seconds uh, with every pedal stroke the chasers get closer the peloton at 35 seconds TJ Van Garden's group I think that's a little bit less than 10 seconds <laughs> I think it's almost zero seconds at this point they're just about to catch the breakaway yep we're having a reforming at the front end of the main field but it's only 35 seconds back to the peloton which is being led by Omega Pharma Lotto and Team Katusha. Philippe Gilbert's team at Omega Pharma Lotto being assisted time and time again by the men from Katusha and the team of Joachim Rodriguez. Joachim Rodriguez so close to winning this event last year, kicking himself, he went just a little bit too early. Maybe just 50 minutes, 50 meters, excuse me, too early, and Cadell Evans was just barely able to get the better of him. I think Rodriguez would like to have a redo on that one, and he might get his chance in 20 kilometers or 12 miles time. It's all about biding your time, but first of all, what this group have got to do on the right-hand side, the peloton, they've got to catch this group, which has swelled in numbers. There will be some reinforcements now. Alexander Kolovnev was second there last year in Liege, Baston Liege. He's a dangerous man to have in a breakaway like this, but I don't think they're going to get too far off the front of the main field because whenever we pull back like this from the helicopter, it's usually an indicator to show us that. That's the gap between the main field. It's not much more than 400 meters distance. 25 seconds, the gap now. Leopard Trek on the front with Omega Pharma. When riders in the breakaway start to watch each other, start to gauge how much effort uh, uh, they need to stay away and how much uh, energy they still have for the finale, sometimes there's a little bit of a hesitation in the breakaway. Well, in the main field, there's absolutely no hesitation. The Omega riders know what they need to do. Each time they go to the front, they're going absolutely flat out, drilling it to maximum capacity, and that's when the gaps start to tumble down, and it makes it so very hard for the breakaways to succeed. Well, in about seventh or eighth position there, there's a rider in a black and white jersey of Leopard Trek. That's Andy Schleck, and he's riding very well to the front end of the main field. I would have thought that on a day like today, he will sacrifice himself for his brother, Frank Schleck. Frank has got a much better finishing uh, sprint at the top of a climb like the Mur de Huy, but you can almost feel the nervousness now, can't you? Well, you can see all the teams getting themselves organized, all of the rabbits bank riders over to the right hand side on the other side you've got to uh, Omega Pharma Lotto getting themselves in a cohesive unit at the front end of the peloton because 19 seconds is all it is now that's 300 meters separating the leaders from the main pack Patevsky Le liquid gas Cannondale rider still in the breakaway that's just because they caught him at the top of the hill and not halfway up the hill otherwise he probably would have been dropped immediately but the three riders that were in the break were caught just on a flat road so they have a, a chance to sit on the wheels for a few more kilometers but uh, uh, conventional wisdom suggests that they won't be there for very much longer well, that was Enrico Gasparotto coming through here, here in the turquoise jersey. You might just see those bands on his sleeves, a former Italian national champion. They're just around the corner, that breakaway group. But look at the speed of the main field now. They really are trying to get themselves set up. There's another nasty little climb to go before we get down towards the finishing climb of the Mur de Huy. And that's where we might see some last-minute attacks by these riders trying to steal an advantage over the peloton before they get into Huy for the last time. Well, the flesh alone can be lost on these long straight roads if you're in the bad position or you have a mechanical or you get behind caught behind a crash so imperative now this is the the business end of the peloton being led by the omega squad of philippe gilbert he knows that they need to do their work now they can't wait for any closer kilometers to the finish line they have to establish control of the peloton so he can sit on in the ideal position and he is tacked in just behind his teammates that are doing a big turn of work on the front five guys from omega on the front joined by maxime Mofort from the leopard trek squad this is going to be a great finale but so far flawless riding by the omega squad of philippe gilbert just over you've got uh, Nicky Sorensen and Chris Anker Sorensen uh, for team uh, Saxo Bank there looking after the interests of Alberto Contador there he is those yellow sunglasses peeping through again this is getting to be a very nervous part of the race on the left hand side you can see the the leading group of riders uh, they're all working exceptionally well together but I can't believe they're going to survive especially Bob because of the way the main field is organized in the work that it's doing gap is stabilized at 20 seconds on this long sweeping descent Peloton should be able to chip away at that lead. They have a much more momentum and inertia in that big group of riders, especially on a wide sweeping boulevard like this. It's very tough for just a few riders to stay away. The gap's still right around 20 seconds, 17 kilometers to go. One tough climb before the 
last flat roads by the River Meuse, and then the final ascension of the Mur de Wee. Well, that was a little move there. That was Thomas Lovequist trying to get himself away from the main peloton here this afternoon. He's seen that there are a number of riders sitting on the back of this group. He doesn't want any passengers, and he's seen this as the possibility of a slip off the front. Now, this could be a very good move for Thomas Lovequist because if the main field comes back up now and catches the remnants of that breakaway, there's always that little moment of, of misunderstanding. He's been joined here by Kirienka. He's the rider from Movistar. Now, this could be quite a good move. Kiryanka, as well as the rider from Sky, Lovqvist. Good little move here. They were the last two riders to catch up to that breakaway, and so uh, maybe the freshest also in the break. Lovqvist coming across to, uh, from a small group to the break, and now they have put a little bit of daylight between themselves and the other riders that were previously in the break, who caught the four early men from a day-long breakaway. They had a maximum advantage of 17 minutes, but now they are all back in the fold. No, they certainly are. Now, this is two riders who will combine their efforts, so both of them very good individual time trialists. Uh, Kirienka, good time trialist from uh, Belarusia, but of course the stronger man from Sky Pro Cycling there, Thomas Lovquist, uh, second in the Olympic Games at individual time trial in Beijing. And that was just three years ago. They've now got themselves a nice, interesting little move off the front, but uh, don't forget, around the corner there's a man with a hammer and he'll probably smack you right on the face when this next climb of the day comes. That would be Philippe Gilbert, I'm presuming. <laughs> and his teammates doing a great job, flawless riding. When you have a rider you are so confident in who has delivered the goods on a number of occasions already, it makes it that much easier for you as a teammate to put in the effort at the front of the peloton. And that's what we see happening now. The Omega team, teammates of Philippe Gilbert, they know unequivocally that if they do their job, Philippe Gilbert is perhaps the most likely man to win the race out of the oh, almost 200 starters in the event. Just a quick glimpse there of that banner, 15 kilometers to go down towards the finish. We're inside of the final 10 miles. This is the second chase group on the road, Colome, Van Tomme, Golas, Gasparotto, and Preben Van Hecker. But they are now looking to try and pull themselves back to the two riders who have stolen a slight advantage, uh, Thomas Lovquist and uh, Vasily Kirienka, who are around about 10 seconds in front of this chase group. Kirienka having a good spring, was right up there in Criterium International, almost stealing the victory from Frank Schleck, but not quite able to do that. But he gave Frank Schleck quite a fight all the way to the finish just a couple of weeks ago in the Criterium International, and that's a good result. Kirienka is a solid rider, and this is a great move off the front of the little bit of a breakaway. And if you feel like the break is hesitating and some riders are not contributing to the pacemaking, it's much better to go up the road and get a little bit of a gap with somebody that is motivated to do some work and these two men Lovkvist and Kirienka have left their breakaway companions behind I'm a little bit surprised to see Kolobnev be caught out by that a very <laughs> solid performer he's always competitive in the one-day classics especially the hilly ones they're about to get caught by the peloton though the peloton hot on their heels and charging down this big wide open boulevard before the last two climbs of flesh alone well it's still TJ Van Garden on the front of that uh, chase group but if he looks over his shoulder now he will see the mass of the main field charging down upon them now this could be the moment Bob where there's a little bit of confusion once they catch that group you sigh of relief we've done the hard work we've done what we needed to but then you start adding up the guys are there and you think uh oh we've got to start chasing again yes exactly you can't get the math wrong when you're chasing the breakaways if the brake splits up you have to make sure that you catch all the riders sometimes that's hard to do when you're going flat out down the road and riders are coming at you from behind and from the front so we'll see how Omega Pharma handles this next little bit of tactical nuance here. Philippe Gilbert rotating there very close to the front, but he needs to pay attention for another 10 kilometers before the final ascension of the Mur de Wee starts, and then he can put on the afterburners and do what he does best, win big bike races. Well, Tete de la Corsa, Vasily Kirienka of Team Movistar, joined by Thomas Lovquist, 13 kilometers to go, and they've got a 21-second advantage. And you can see, Bob, definitely these guys from Omega Pharma Lotto have got one thing on the back of their minds here this afternoon. Philippe Gilbert get him to the climb in an ideal position then he can try and finish off the job this is the penultimate climb of the day the Côte de Ref 2.1 kilometers long an average gradient of 6% but probably could be the end of the breakaway because these guys they must realize the hammer is going down behind you've got team 
Dominique Lampre looking after Cunego. You've got Omega Farmalotto looking after Philippe Gilbert. The pressure and the speed in that main field must be atrocious. Oh, and the attacks now that come thick and fast from the peloton in the finale of a bike race can wipe out any advantage. Just two men left in the front now. The other riders in that breakaway have been caught by the peloton. Katusha still very active at the front. Joaquin Rodriguez must be feeling pretty good, so he's put his riders on the front. He has a great chance. Fantastic sprint at the end of a steep climb like we have in today's race. Well, everybody now playing that waiting game. Also moving up, you can see the turquoise jerseys of Team Astana. They'll be looking after Alexander Vinokurov. On his day, a very explosive finisher, Alexander Vinokurov. And again, there's so many, Bob, there are so many of the big names still in with a chance of the kill here. We move over on the right-hand side there. Uh, Uskatel Uskadi trying to cause a little bit of a flurry. Let's see what this gap looks like. Official gap is giving us as 18 seconds. Bob, that isn't 18 seconds either, is it? And most certainly not. Uskatel on the attack, followed by Leopard Track. Looks like Fabian Wegman there. And Nicky Sorensen on the Saxo Bank squad, the champion of Denmark. So he has that red and white jersey, but he is definitely a teammate of Alberto Contador. Tucked safely in the peloton so far. Well, they've got the race referee out of the gap now. Uh, the main field can see their prey. Thomas Lovquist in first position. Vasily Kirienka, number 95 in the dark blue jersey of Movistar. The Spanish squad, which uh, for many years, as you said, was the home of Miguel Indurain. It's a new team, a new sponsor right now. As you can see, again, we've got uh, Katusha doing all of that pacemaking. I believe that's Daniel De Luca. That's a domestic deluxe for Joaquin Rodriguez. Danilo De Luca, a great champion, is all right from, from Italy. Now on the Russian team, Katusha. And he is doing the big turn of work at the front of the peloton. You couldn't ask for a better teammate than Danilo De Luca, capable of winning events like this himself, doing the unselfish work now for his teammate Joaquin Rodriguez, who has a great chance to win flesh alone. Well, I think the pain is certainly whistling in everybody's thighs here this afternoon. When you see a man like Danilo De Luca taking turns at the front end of the main field, that all of a sudden gives you an indication of how serious these guys are taking that small two-man breakaway. Alberto Contador still sitting there, Bob, in now 10th to 12th position, and not too far away from the front, Ivan Basso. Ivan Basso having a good ride. Great to see the Italian champion at the front here of a classic, not generally his uh, his stomping grounds, but uh, Ivan Basso having a good day in the flesh alone. Look at the effort now on Lovskvist's face. <laughs> He's really suffering. Gap is hovering 16 seconds. I think it's a little bit less than that. Inside of about 11 kilometers, six plus miles to go. They are getting in to the very last climb of the day, the Mur de Wii. It'll all come down to that. Interesting to see the Omega squad disappearing from the front of the peloton. Maybe they're collecting their energy and waiting for that big lead out for Philippe Gilbert just in the final flat miles before the last climb of the day. Well, Kirienka doesn't look like he's suffering at all on the left-hand side, the Tete de la Course, the front end of the bike race. And again, action coming from the main field on the right-hand side. The peloton now want to put this down to order. They want a little bit of order coming into the main field as HTC High Road move into first position. Down into third there, you can see Danilo De Luca. A little bit further back, here, you can see Alberto to Contador, he's uh, got the yellow sunglasses on. He's never been very far away from the front end of this pack. That's very hard to do to concentrate throughout the day, let alone the physical requirements, but just to have the presence of mind to continue following the forward momentum and stay right in the front at the tip of the spear, out of trouble, and in the perfect, most efficient place to be in the peloton. And Alberto Contador got to hand it to him. He's ridden perfectly so far today. 10 kilometers to go now. Look at this, the action. Everyone's throwing caution to the wind here this afternoon because they're starting to realize we've got a chance here this afternoon. Uh, this man uh, jumping out of the pack is uh, Driesse Devenens. Very good rider from Belgium. He's not a bad climber, but he's seen this as an opportunity to leapfrog across to the two leaders and then hopefully survive on the descent. And then we start to line up for the Mur de Huy. Driesse Devenens, a very strong campaigner for the Quick Step squad. Not a lot to write home about for Quick Step. They haven't had a very successful spring campaign when generally speaking they're accustomed to dominating the classics they haven't been able to do that Tom Bone in a little bit of off form in the the uh, cobbled classics Tour of Flanders and Perry Roubaix but Quickstep needs some big results here now that we're into the hilly classics this is the height of their season for this squad because the Belgian fans so passionate about the classics so far no wins in the big races they need to do something special today 
Well, just looking at that machine he's riding there, Bob, I bet you wish you had one like that. That's an Eddie Merckx machine, and they sponsor, not surprisingly enough, they sponsor the top team in Belgium, Team Quickstep. Still with 10 kilometres to go, these two riders surviving, but it is all now slowly starting to come back together. Lovquist, you can see how hot it's been. You can see the salt there on the jersey of Vasily uh, Kirienka. There's the official 10 kilometer to go banner. Six miles before the finish, there's a sweeping descent, a couple of miles of flat road, and then a tough finishing climb to the top of the Mir du Wee. David is trying to get across to our two leaders, Vasily, uh, excuse me. <laughs> Kirienka. Kirienka, I was going to say Davidenko for a second there, but Kirienka is the man in the breakaway with Thomas Lovqvist. Well, it's all really pretty much uh, in the same straight as we can start to see. Look at the colours of the jerseys all getting themselves together. The gap between the, the leading two riders and the main field is only 12 seconds. And the man halfway across the gap there, uh, Dries Davenens, he's only uh, a couple of seconds in front of the main peloton. Now we're starting off for this is the descent now, Bob, down into the Valley of the Meurs. Katusha on the front of the peloton. Danilo De Luca doing a lot of work for Joaquin Rodriguez. Just uh, about five kilometers of the uh, work left to be done. I think Omega Pharma will be happy to see a little bit of help being done in the peloton by the Katusha riders. Good to see one team that's dominated the racing, not having to do all the work on a brand new situation. And Philippe Gilbert, very clever, took himself off the list of favorites. Maybe Joaquin Rodriguez has uh, already forgotten about Philippe Gilbert, but I don't recommend that. <laughs> no, I would not uh, recommend that at all. The Joaquin Rodriguez, though, will Bob be looking to go one position better than he went last year when he finished in second place in the Flesh Wallon. He, he knows to bide his time, and that's the important thing about the finish towards the top of the Mur de Huy, to wait for the last moment because that final few 50 metres are very nasty indeed. That's Davenant's just hovering off the front end of the main field, and I'm looking at the, the size of that main field, Bob. I think we've lost a couple of riders off over that last climb of the day. Absolutely. The peloton much smaller than it was uh, the last ascension of the Mur de Huy. Riders unable to catch back up. If you're tailed off just a little bit, the peloton in the meanwhile at the front of the field are going absolutely flat out when you have a team like uh, Katusha as strong as they are making a big tempo. The riders trying to get back across. It's virtually impossible. Those gaps translate into huge time losses when you get around to the very last few kilometers of the bike race. Well, Katusha now, they are dedicated. They want this. They want to set it up for their man, Joachim Rodriguez. He'll be sitting in the pack. He'll be looking at his teammates. He will have encouraged them. He will have told them, guys, that the legs are good here this afternoon. I can finish this one off for you. There's also a rider from Uscatel Uscari to the closest to front end of the main field. Davenant's back in the fold. There are only now two men left in front of the peloton and their advantage 11 seconds and these are our two leaders Kirienka and Lovkvist the gap coming down 10 seconds I think when we pan back a little bit from the helicopter you'll see a very motivated <laughs> peloton hot on their heels Katusha doing great work let's we'll see what Joaquin Rodriguez's legs are like for the last few hundred meters of the bike race if he can go one place better than last year and win this year's flesh alone well, it's now the turn of Kolobnev. He is also on Team Katusha. He's having to do the, the work of a teammate, and he'll be looking after Joachim Rodriguez, as you keep mentioning. Lovquist has been dropped off the back of Kirienka here just by a couple of meters, but he really is Kirienka, I think, Bob, just prolonging the agony, because very shortly he will be caught. The official time gap we're giving here is nine seconds, but I tell you what, it isn't very much more than four or five. Uh, just about zero now is uh, Jerome Pino, the teammate of Sylvain Chavanel from the Quickstep squad. Uh, if I can look down there, get the number to confirm that. It looks like his pedaling style being joined by one of the Vacan Soleil riders. So a very exciting finale. This is a dangerous move. Eight kilometers to go. Oftentimes there's a little bit of a hesitation as the leaders, as the big, the big superstars get in position for the finale. Sometimes there's a chance in the closing kilometers to get away. We well, saw Nick Noyens do that in the Tour of Flanders just a couple of weeks ago. Well, we did. The uh, rider from Vacon Soleil coming across the gap there, Bob, is Marco Marcato. He's an Italian rider on that squad. Now, now this is a good move by Jérôme Pino. He's a great bike rider. Been around for a long time. He was brought across to Team Quickstep when Sylvain Chavanel decided he wanted to come and race in Belgium and all of us so, wow look at that that's a gap that's a great maneuver there by Jerome Pinot worst case scenario his teammates don't have to do any of the chasing in the finale they can sit on the efforts of the other riders and be a little bit fresher for the sprint to the line best case scenario he stays away to the finish and wins the race 
Well, there you can see now we're starting to see a rather interesting situation. Uh, Katusha, they've disappeared from the front end of this pack now this afternoon, and we're now looking at a rather serious move. Marco Mercato of Vacon Soleil, he's uh, right up there alongside the man who made the move, Jerome Pinot, and they've got themselves, Bob, already a seven-second advantage. Something is going to have to go. Good maneuver here by Jerome Pinot. Maybe hesitate a moment, let Marcato get back on the wheel, and they can work together, have a bit of a better chance to win. At this point, with just seven kilometers to go in the f in the in the bike race, all the riders, all the big stars, know that uh, there's almost no way anybody could get enough of a time gap to stay away to the finish line. It's better to sit on the wheels, collect your breath, get in the right position, and get ready for that final attack to the finish line. Well, Pinot is going down this uh, descent here like a man possessed. This descent will pop him out right down alongside the River Meuse. Then they've got a little bit of a flat ride for three or four kilometers. And then it's the big climb, the big haul up to the top of the Mur de Cuy. And I have to say, if they want to win, Bob, they're going to have to start the climb of the Mur de Cuy with at least a 30-second advantage. Otherwise, they'll get swept away. Yes, most certainly. 30 seconds would be the minimum. Perhaps more like a minute would be required to stay away from the charging peloton. You can lose so much time if you reach that point where you're saturated with lactate and you can't make another acceleration. The two riders in the front, Jerome Pinot and Marco Mercado, trying to put in a surprise here, and the peloton still a fairly large number coming into the last climb of the Mur du Oui. A dodgy little corner there, though, as well, isn't it? A hairpin bend as they come off uh, this final climb of the day. There they will uh, pop themselves onto the main road, and that's the main road that will take them into the town of Hui. They are on the same course now as they were just a few moments ago when they went out on that final lap of the day. They're looking at five kilometers to go, 18 seconds, and all of a sudden a little bit of panic on board the Leopard Trek Express. That's Andy Schleck doing the pacemaking on the front, obviously trying to set this up for Frank. 18 seconds is the time gap, so that's a great attack by Jerome Pinot and Mercado. Andy Schleck, alarm bells going off for the peloton. That is too big of a gap, five kilometers to go, three miles, and Andy Schleck, one of the perhaps outside pre-race favorites for victory here, is doing the work. Now joined by the Omega Pharma squad of Philippe Gilbert. Well, they've come to the front now. They realize that this is the dramatic moment. Uh, they don't want to see this race disappear, but look at that. That's Philippe Gilbert just sitting in the uh, wheel of his teammate, but the gap now is up to 19 seconds. 19 seconds, the two riders in front continuing to stretch out their advantage. Philippe Gilbert's second wheel. He doesn't want anything to go wrong. He'd rather expend a little bit extra energy to stay in the right position than risk saving a little bit of energy by sitting in the pack and having a rider crash near him or having a mechanical. Oh, well, now it's Rabobank there thinking about their man, Robert Hessink, a chance for him. But over on the left-hand side, you can see those red and white jerseys of Katusha. Those riders are looking after their man, Joachim Rodriguez. The uh, pink and blue jerseys, Lamprey, they're looking after Damiano Kuniger, but the gap continues to rise for the two men in the front of this race Pino and Mercato it's now up to 20 seconds well it's a it's a battle for position in the field for Philippe Gilbert Damiano Cunego and all of the other pre-race favorites Frank Schleck as well still in there and Sammy Sanchez and they're trying to stay out of danger but they're not doing a big effort to close down this this gap they know that they need a lot more time than this to in order to win and stay away because the finishing climb <laughs> Is, uh, making him uh, very evident at the front end of the peloton. He's following Joachim Rodriguez on the outside. There's Damiano Kuniger moving up to the front as well. Tony Martin in about 12th or 15th position. Great to see Tony Martin having a good day in the flesh alone. Dangerous to ride on the uh, far left-hand side of the road. A little bit of a curb there. Better have your bike handling skills. And when those riders come back into the field, that's when you see a lot of the crashes and problems. Riders desperate to improve their position will use whatever part of the road that they are able to do. But sometimes when they try to reintegrate into the field, that's when the problems occur. Well, number 71, that really is quite strange. Uh, a few moments ago, we we're looking at Andy Schleck all over the front end of the main field, and now he's gone straight to the back of the pack.
Well, Andy Schleck will now uh, follow the wheels, try to catch his breath, and uh, maybe have some strength left over for the final kilometer to the finish. Straight up the Mir Dewey. And now we've got Rabobank in control, but Bob, three kilometers to go, 20 seconds the advantage, and still waiting in the wings. You've got Joachim Rodriguez with his teammates up alongside him, and, of course, you've got there uh, Jürgen Vanderbroek, I think, today will be looking after the interests of Philippe Gilbert. 19 seconds left. They're in the town of Huy. Two more kilometers to go. They'll see that flam rouge for the final time, and then, bang, straight up to the top. They'll swing off this big, wide relatively easy boulevard and to one of the most difficult climbs in all of cycling, the Mir Dewey, a mythic climb in cycling, and the last ascension. Big tempo being done by Rabobank. Robert Haysink, their big star, hoping to do something special. He's got a good chance. He's a great climber, and it's a very steep climb to the finish. Two kilometers to go, and still 17 seconds. That's Jürgen Vandenbroek, a little bit further back, the rider from Omega Farmer Lotto, looking after the interest of Philippe Gilbert. That looks like Alexander Vinokurov, Bob, moving up into about six or seven position in the turquoise jersey of Astana. Almost forgot about Vino Kurov. Haven't seen the Astana riders near the front, but Vino now moving into a good position, a very powerful rider. Got a great sprint at the finish of long, hard race. Perfect for this type of conditions. Christian Kinesa, the na national champion of Germany there, moving his own teammate right up to the front end of the main field. Now it's uh, Michael Albacini of HTC High Road, getting the HTC High Road train lined up nice and smartly on the front end of the peloton. Watch out for Tony Martin there, Bob, sitting nice and comfortably in third position. There is the Flamme Rouge, the Mur de Huy, 1.3 kilometers long, 10% the gradient, and these two riders are going to go under the banner there with an advantage of 14 seconds over the pack, but they're getting all of the cars and all of the motorbikes out of the gap because they know this race is about to unfold. Well, in less than a mile, 700 feet difference in elevation gain, so you can see or you can get a feeling for how steep that is. That is a huge bit of uh, climbing there now. One kilometer to go. Looks like Tony Martin on the front of the peloton for HTC. Great time trialist and on really good form having won Perry Nice earlier in the year. Well, the main field now are on the climb. Everybody in the Flesh Wallon is on the final climb of the day. That's Tony Martin there in second position. There's a little move there going forward again. It looks look very much like the shape of uh, Andy Schleck, who was trying to move forward. But look at this move now as we can start to see the main field looking left, looking right. They're trying to get their leaders to the front end of the main field. We're inside the last kilometre, Bob, but this last kilometre on a climb like this takes an awful long time. And the breakaway just dangling off the front. Jerome Pinot, Marco Mercado had a great little manoeuvre they got up to about 20 seconds lead, but that obviously wasn't nearly enough. They're about to get swept up by the chasing peloton. Well, Albacini is the HTC high road there, rider in second position uh, in the main field. He's waiting for the moment to move, but the two attackers, uh, well, look at that, Bob. In a space of around about 300 meters, they lost 15 seconds. There is Philippe Gilbert. He's up into uh, third place in the main field. Locked on his wheel, though, Joachim Rodriguez. Rookie Joaquim Rodriguez on the wheel of Gilbert. Gilbert looking very menacing there. Easy. <laughs> Oh! As he goes around that corner, not too far away from the front, also Sammy Sanchez. Now the challenge is starting to come here from the Garmin Cervelo team, and, and they are now, I think that's Christophe Lemavel, the French rider on Garmin Cervelo. <laughs> Bobby's in complete control of this race, but Rodriguez now is trying to keep himself in contest. But there's a gap, it's widening slowly but surely. Philippe Gilbert is starting to dominate this bike race. He has waited patiently in the main field throughout the whole of the day for this one moment, 200 meters to go. Big acceleration from Gilbert, but a long ways from the finish line. Let's see if he can hold this acceleration. A lot of riders have tried this, a lot of riders have failed. Philippe Gilbert on the form is of his life, just a few meters now to the finish line. Well, Philippe Gilbert... <laughs> there 
there, the flag of Belgium. He knows he's got this. He's a French-speaking Belgium. He's dreamed about winning this bike race, and the crowd will go absolutely ballistic for Philippe Gilbert as he gets the win that he's been looking for for many, many years. Coming across the line in second place there were Joaquin Rodriguez, and Sammy Sanchez was right up there in third. Sanchez coming from a long ways back to get third in the race. Joaquin Rodriguez... <laughs> But that man, the man of the hour, Belgian rider, French speaker, Philippe Gilbert, the winner of this year's Flesh Alone, didn't count himself. <laughs> That shows you what kind of form Philippe Gilbert is on this season. Flesh uh, Brabanson a few days ago, and then Amstel Gold Race, and now Flesh Wallone. Great riding by the man, probably the best bike racer in Belgium currently. Big superstar of maybe the most crazy country about cycling, Belgium. Well, the big question now, Bob, is as you mentioned, the Flesh Brabanson, the Amstel Gold Race, the Flesh Wallone. <laughs> superstar comparisons with Eddie Merckx cannot be too long in the coming for Philippe Gilbert and the amazing thing about Philippe Gilbert he doesn't uh, he's not concerned about the fact that he's a, a Walloon or, or he's a or Flemish he says I am a Belgian and he wants to represent the Belgian people the joint Belgian people and that might be a good thing for the professional cycling and of course for Belgium which is a country separated by two languages the thing about Philippe Gilbert is that not only does <laughs>
So, Philippe, a very big victory for you today. Maybe uh, one of the races that we weren't expecting you to win. Nobody was expecting you to try and win Flesh Wallon today. Yeah. It's a big surprise for me, actually. I wasn't really expecting to, to race this hard today. But uh, the, the flesh went on. Uh, it's, it's a big race for me to try and win. For me, it's extremely important to win something like the fresh Wallon. So, quite quite extraordinary. Even at the start, I had, a, I had a little bit of a difficult time getting into the race because I was still tired from last Sunday. And I was suffering just a little bit because of that. I was riding at the back uh, very early on in the race. Just uh, I wasn't really uh, too interested in how the race was developing. But then after a few kilometers, I started to go a little bit better. So then the teammates said, come on, come to the front, get yourself to the front. And then about 60 kilometers to go, I went to the front end of the pack. And I don't know if that's uh, what gave me that little bit of uh, freshness down towards the end of the race. I was really good. Uh, the second time we went up the Mur, I started to feel uh, pretty good. And then I said to the teammates, uh, OK, guys, I think we can go for this today. But when that group was gone, uh, I had to get the guys to the front to chase them down. And, and all of that uh, got, me, uh, got me into the race. And I started to get much more motivated. Right at the beginning, I started to talk to guys like uh, Vinikurov to see uh, what he thought he was going to do. I didn't really think I had much of a chance on a, a climb like this. And then uh, once we got to the climb, it was the time to attack. And I, I'm glad that I didn't attack on the penultimate climb because I probably would have got caught before the finish line here in uh, Hui. There was a couple of guys, uh, uh, Moreno was over to my right hand side, I could see I uh, was a little bit blocked in, and then I said, uh, right, before Rodriguez gets himself into a good place, uh, now you've got to go for it, and that's why I went at about 300 meters to go, and I could see all the other big uh, favorites, they were a little bit further behind me, and I knew as soon as I went, I had to go uh, all the way down to the finish line. It's very difficult on this climb to, to go past riders, because when you're out of the saddle, you take a lot of place up on the road. So I, I made a gap straight away, and then I had enough to uh, had enough time at the finish to to really enjoy this victory. And uh, on our on our lands here, it was great with all the uh, the Belgian flags and the the Wallon flags. It's fantastic. So is this the most uh, beautiful victory that you've had? As I said, well, it really is a bit of a surprise for me to win here. Well, there you go. I don't know what my limits are right now. I'll just have to find out. So, too, too tired for Sunday? I was, I was tired on Sunday. No, he's talking about next Sunday. Oh, I think I did plenty of kilometers today. I was sat at the back of the race. I only did 60 kilometers really hard in the, the last part of the race. So I, uh, I looked after my energy in the first part. So I've got a couple of days. To, uh, we've had the Amstel, and I think I recovered before the flesh well on. It's an amazing victory for you today. Incredible. Yeah, for me it was a big surprise because um, before before starting this morning I I was thinking thinking about this race and uh, I told to myself that uh, it's maybe the, the hardest race to win in my career because it's a very hard finish and uh, against the, the pure climber like uh, very light guys like uh, Contador, Rodriguez and Co. I'm I'm not. Uh, on the same level, so I I also also have a good climb because I was in the front from the beginning, and I, I saw when I look uh, behind me that uh, Rodriguez and Contador on the second and third line, and I knew that uh, if I go early, they have to pass a few guys, and uh, I took always or, or sometimes, and uh, I had uh, the gap, and uh, it was enough, and then uh, and enjoy it the last 100 meters because. We, because it was before my public, my family, my friends, and it was amazing the last 100 meters.